A couple of weeks ago, I began this series, and I think it'll be a series of two, hopefully, I'm aiming for that, uh, simply entitled, Be Blessed and at Rest. Now, I want to confess to you right up front, as I did the first Sunday uh, I began this series, that the hardest thing I do in my Christian walk is rest. I don't think I'm alone. We want to get in. I, I, you know, at times people have called me, you're Mr. Fix-It. You want to get in and just take care of everything. And, just, and God says to us, would you just stop? I've got this. Would you just stop? I've got to stop it. Yeah, <laughs> they're laughing at me. Yep, Mr. Fix-It. Uh, we are, as I've prayed, we're control freaks. Come on, am I the only one? Okay. And, and we're so afraid we're going to miss something. we got to go through all the moments of the day and, and grab a hold of everything and make sure we, we turn it just right. And even when we pray, we want to make sure we don't make any mistakes. God says, I love you. It was a marvelous prayer uh, this morning. Folks, the book of Romans through the Apostle Paul and the Holy Spirit says, Christ loved us when we were yet enemies of the cross. And if he loved us when we were enemies of the cross, he is certainly going to love us now that we're his children. There is nothing you need to fear because there's nothing you can't handle in Christ. You say, but you don't know the problems I've got. Here's what God wants us to do. Boy, God, have you got a problem. Boy, God, have you got a problem. You pray through your problems and you say, okay, God, boy, God, have you got a problem. God wants us, longs for us, and is expecting us to get to that point in our Christian walk where we learn to rest in Him. We may not do it perfectly this side of eternity, at least 70 years of, 71 years of walking in the Lord. Haven't gotten there yet. Haven't reached that state of perfection yet. But I was telling Paul, I'm a lot better than I used to be. A lot more calm and relaxed than I used to be. And I'm working on getting better with it. God wants us to be blessed and at rest. There remains, or Hebrews 4.9 says, a rest for the people of God. Is you the people of God or not? How many of you are the people of God? You've received Christ. Okay, if you've received Christ, then i got news for you. You are the people of God, and He has a rest for you. Teacher says, you get ready, go back to school. Oh, God bless you. God love you. Ah. I taught college for 20 years, and, and, and I, that's great because they pay to come see me, you know. Your students, you've got the roughest crowd in the whole country. You know, I, I don't know how you do it, but God bless you. How are you going to do that as you're putting together all of that stuff under COVID? How do you do that? You rest in Christ and trust him to show you how to do that. Each of you in your life, rest in God. Trust him to show you how to get through the struggles you're going through. We closed last, uh, the last time I preached on this series with this verse, uh, Matthew chapter 11, 22. The words of Jesus, is there rest? Come to me. Why are we not resting? Because we don't come to him. We're trying to figure it out in our head. How do I handle this problem? We're trying to figure out what do I do to straighten all this mess out? News alert, you can't. And you don't have to because God wants to do it in you and through you and for you. He never leaves us nor forsakes us. He promises us that. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. You're burdened. And I, what? Well, I might if you're having a good day. Depending on how you behave that day, I might and I might not. Is that what it says? 
No, he says, I will, and then there's that word, I will give you rest. He doesn't say work for it, earn it, make all the right decisions, do everything right, and I'll give you my rest. If, if you manage to do everything right, and by the way, nobody ever has, you can enter my rest. It's not based on getting everything right. It's based on resting in the grace and the mercy and the love of God. Anybody here ever failed or sinned? At least four of us. I'm going to pray for the rest of you. Cast that lying spirit out of you in a minute. Okay. I will give you rest, he says. It is a gift. You don't have to earn it. You have to work hard for it. Most of us grew up, as I did, uh, in a family where we, we were taught love by what professionals have called uh, performance orientation. If you did the right things, you got affection. If you messed up, guess what? You ain't getting no love. That's the human condition, folks. Performance orientation. You do well, everybody will love you. Do badly, you're in rough shape. And you'll have a hard time finding people to love and accept you. That's not the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is when you mess up, God loves you anyway. His grace and His mercy is there anyway. He doesn't. Another newsflash. God does not expect that you will do everything right every moment of every day. And He loves you when you don't. He says, I will give you the gift of rest if you'll just... I love imagery. Paul, that, that's beautiful. For a couple of courses that I taught, one of them called Communion with God uh, in college. It was a 21-week course, three hours a, a session. And I taught them guided imagery to just be able to picture in your mind what is it like that you're there with Jesus and he's loving you and maybe he's stroking your, breath, your, your forehead or he's you know, rubbing his hands through the lack of your hair in my case. Uh, or he's, whatever he's doing, you know, a pat on the arm. I I'm a tactile person. Don't ever assume I mean something nefarious if I come up to you and I pat you on the arm or uh, just, you know, your hubby brought up the offering and... And I just love your hubby. Is that okay if I love your hubby? He's a super guy. Uh, and he handed me the plate, and I just reached under and patted his hand. God is tactile. He wants to hold you. Come to him. He wants to enfold you in his arms. You say, God doesn't have arms. He said, oh, yeah, I do. And Isaiah, he said, do you think my arms are short? That I cannot reach you? He said, your sins have kept you far from me, and I need you to confess them so that I can hold you again in my arms. He says, my arms are not shortened. Uh, God loves you so much, and he never expected you will handle it all perfectly. But we grew up learning we had to handle it all perfectly, didn't we? Keeping all those balls in the air. Don't let any drop. You know, and boy, do you hear about it if you let one of those drop. That's the world. Christ says, let me give you rest. Come unto me. So with that thought, let's get back to reality. How in the world are we supposed to handle this life so filled with fears of, what did they do? There we go. Of, I'll put it down. <laughs> Uh, of pandemics, COVID-19, and, and others as well. Economic tension. This is, a, this is the cable news version now, okay? Just don't lose that peace you felt a minute ago. Just realize we're going to come back to it. 
But this is all you're facing. Then we're going to talk about why. Pandemics, economic tension, unemployment, societal hatred, absolute hatred out there, violent protests. Those are called riots, and they've started up again in, in Portland. Mistrust of all authority. Not only mistrust, we're at the point where we reject as a nation any authority. If you're the president, you get no respect from us. You know, I look back to when President Obama was president, and I didn't agree with almost anything he did, but I still respected him as the president. President Trump doesn't get that today. If anything, he gets hatred and slander and everything under the sun. There's not just a mistrust of authority. There's a rejection of all authority. Okay? All of that's going on. Businesses, schools, and churches closing permanently. I mean, you drive to some of my favorite restaurants, gone for good. Bob Evans. I love Bob Evans. Gone. You know, I, I guess I'm going to open up under new <clears throat> management, but increasing crime. I, all the time I'm reading about the increased crime due to all these riots and all. Global terrorism, uh, geographic wars, political wars. It's, it, I can remember wars going on my whole life between the Democrats and the Republicans. It's not now. Now it's between good and evil. Those are the political wars. And anything goes to slur your candidate. Anything. Any lie you can think of, you can pay people to see, say spurious things about your can, the other candidate, your opposing candidate. And, and you can even get the CIA and, and you can get the FBI and you can get the courts involved and they'll cheat with you. Where have we come to? You know, what are we looking at? Political wars. And then you just look at the natural occurrences. Earthquakes, hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, fires. My wife and I last night were talking about the fires in California and the smoke's coming all the way to New York from the fires in California. Now, are you all good and depressed? Have I gotten you depressed? <laughs> We went from being depressed. You say, Gordon, it's supposed to work the opposite way. First we're depressed, and then you get us to rest. I want you to understand what's going on. And I mean what's really going on, because what's happening is there are two diametrically opposed rulers in this world. And they have created war against each other. And guess what? You're in the middle of that war. Does it feel like war to you? It feels like war to me. 99% of you know I have a son who just retired from 27 years in, uh, in the Army as a combat medic, uh, helicopter combat medic, 27 years. Uh, and I'm here to tell you, he didn't come home the way he went. Uh, you know, it has affected him. It's affected everything from his sleep to his relationships, all kinds of things. We understand that when we talk about war. What we don't understand is that you're in a war. It's the war between good and evil. Dr. Donald Greg Barnhouse, uh, back in the 60s, wrote a book, a 900-page book called The Eternal Conflict. And it was all about the war between good and evil. Uh, and folks, you are living in that war. And beyond that, it's not just that you're living in that war. It's that that war lives in you. The war between the flesh, which is ruled by Satan, and the spirit, which is ruled by God, inside of you. Some of you are looking puzzled, and I'm not sure I understand that. How many of you feel like there's a war going on inside of you? You know you're supposed to do this, but you really want to do this. Some of you may have felt like, I know I'm supposed to go to church this morning, but I really don't want to go. Can I just please pull the covers up over my head? That's a war. 
But that war goes on all day long, every day. All day long, every day. You're the worship leader. You had to come. What are you talking about? Thank you for being here. <laughs> She's looking at me like, yeah, I really want to pull the covers up over my head this morning. You did great, by the way. Thank you. Uh, but there is a war going on, not only in the universe, but within you. And there's two rulers at war with each other. And we all feel that. And let's talk about who those uh, two rulers are. Because when we talk about resting in God, you will never get to the point where you're able to rest until you understand, number one, you're in a war, and number two, the war's already been won, and it was God who won it. And you're on the right side. You're on the right side of that war. It was decided 2,000 years ago when Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. And you and I are the Marines that God sent in as Christians for the mopping up operations before he returns to take over his kingdom and it'll rule the universe when he's done. My wife and I were out this morning at about 5.15. You say, well, what are you, sick? No, she was going to work. Uh, and, and we were out looking at the stars and we were stargazing and how beautiful they were. And she said, they're so gorgeous. And I said, you and I are going to rule over those stars all over the universe when God's done with us. And you are too. And wherever Christ travels in his new heavens and new earth, you, we, the body of Christ, his bride, his army, we're defined as by all of those within the Bible. We will be with him everywhere he goes. No limitations by the flesh. We won't have to... You know, jump a 747 anymore to get to the other side of the country. Look at these rulers. And we're going to go through several slides of these, hopefully quickly. Two rulers, Satan. Who is he? He's a thief and a robber. And what's he come to do? To steal from you life and joy and hope and strength and health. He comes to steal from you. Because that's what he is. Jesus said he's a thief and a robber. And ultimately he seeks to destroy you and to kill you. To destroy you and to kill you. That's his goal. I'm amazed at how simply and how often we kind of give in to Satan's goals thinking, well, it's just a little flirtation here with, with sin. Do you understand he seeks to kill you? And he's waiting for you to give him a half an inch. And he'll take a mile. Sin and its power will take you further than you ever thought you could go in the wrong direction. It will hold you longer than you ever expected to go. And it'll cost you more than you ever dreamed it'll cost you. That's what sin does. And that's because Satan is a deceiver. He's a devourer. He seeks to kill you with sin. He hates you. You say, Pastor, yet he hates you. Why does he hate you? Because he hates God. Let's go back to the very beginning of this when God was created by Satan. We've got a slide on this. I'm a little ahead of it. But when uh, God created Satan, excuse me, did I say God was created by Satan? I, not good. <laughs> Roll that video back, that uh, digital back there, uh, where God, was, uh, God created Satan. And when he created, he created him perfect in every way. In fact, <clears throat> he was so beautiful and so talented that God made him the choir director of heaven. And all of the angels were led in praise for generations by Lucifer. And his very name, Lucifer, comes from, we use the word loose or light. Lucent, light. It meant light of the morning or glory of the morning. That's what his name meant. And he led all the praises of heaven, but he got to the point where he said, I'm sick and tired of giving praise to God. 
I hate him. I hate bringing praise to God. I'm going to start getting the praise myself. And he led a rebellion, just like in Portland and just like in Seattle and all of these other cities. He led a rebellion, a riot. And one-third of the angels were kicked out of heaven, along with Satan, who was their leader. And God sent them to earth, and now we call earth the capital city of wickedness. Why? Because Satan rules. You're in a war. We keep expecting that because we're Christians, everything is going to go well. Folks, you are in a war. You're not home yet. <laughs> we're going to get there, but we're not home yet. And so Satan, as a ruler, comes to steal, to kill you, to destroy what's good, to deceive the whole world, and to devour this world. To destroy it. Why? Because he's mad at God. Because he can't be God. And he hates God. And he hates those who love God. You happen to be the, you know, the focal point of his hate. Because you love God. How many of you love God? Okay. <laughs> now, look at the other ruler in this war. There's only two. God. And he sent his son Christ. Compare the two. Christ comes that we may have life. Satan's purpose is to kill you and bring you to death. Jesus came that you might have life, and even that life more abundantly. And Satan wants to deceive you and devour you. Well, Jesus said, I want to bring you hope and joy and peace. By the way, if you're following the notes I'm on, uh, I've gone down to, well, this is probably 11, slide 12, uh, if you want to look at that. Uh, so even more abundantly, he'll bring you life and he'll bring you hope and joy and peace and love, truth. Two warring rulers, Satan being the created being. Who is he created by again? God. And there's coming a day when God will say to Satan, you're done, that's it. In fact, it's called harmageddon. In the Greek, har Armageddon. You know the word in the English, Armageddon. The Hebrew or the Greek is called Har Megiddo or the hill of Megiddo. And I've been there, I've stood there, and it's like a short L and then a long one like this. The scripture tells us that when Satan lines up with all of his troops for that war, that when that war begins, Christ will simply look at Satan and say, you're done. I'm not pointing at you as Satan. I don't know. I, forgive me. I don't know what that was all about. But uh, no implication whatsoever. He'll simply say, you're done. That's it. There's a war before that where the blood runs as high as a horse's bridle. But the final battle, he will look at Satan and simply say, it's over. You're done. I cast you in the lake of fire. Uh, so, He's coming to the point where he's bringing an end to that. God is the creator of all that's good. Satan is a counterfeiter. Which would you rather have? A $100 bill or a counterfeit $100 bill? Obviously, you want the real thing. Spiritually, do you want what Satan offers, which is a counterfeit? Or do you want what God offers, which is the real deal? We want the real deal. God, creator, Satan, Simply a created being. God is divine. Satan is demonic. God dearly loves you. Would you look at somebody close to you and say, God really loves me. God really loves you and you and you and you. He really loves you. <clears throat> Satan's whole motif is to, and, and culture is to bring dishonor. Do you know what God's purpose is to bring you to honor. God wants to develop integrity and honor within your life. <clears throat> God, unlike Satan who is divisive and breeds disagreements everywhere, God is dedicated to healing your body, soul, and spirit. That's the nature of God to healing you and bringing restoration where there was division, where Satan brought division, God wants to bring restoration and healing. In churches, in relationships, in marriages, 
He wants to bring all of that. There are two kingdoms and two cultures. As you look at the left, what would be your left-hand side of this, you recognize that's cable news. That's what goes on in all of our cities. That's, this is what's happening in America. Contrast the king culture of the kingdom of darkness. And by the way, let me read for you. Uh, it's a particular passage I want to read for you. It's 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. <clears throat> Do you want to know who you are? Do you want to know why you're going to win? And why you can just relax and let go through you? He says in 1 Peter 2, 9, But you are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. You are the priesthood that ministers Christ to the world. It is void of anything good. And you're the priesthood that ministers love and joy and peace. And we tend, unfortunately, to minister neuroticism. <laughs> I get that way. I don't know if you get that way. But left to my own human flesh, I can get neurotic. And God says, that's not what I want the world to look like. I want you to show the world love and peace and joy. And they'll look at you and I and say, can I have that? Where did you get that? All right. So you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation, it says. What is that nation? The kingdom of light. You are a holy nation, the kingdom of light. You are God's own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of the kingdom of darkness and into his kingdom of light. And that's where we're getting this uh, you know, light, light and darkness. Two cultures, two kingdoms. Darkness, which is evil, produces fear, whereas the kingdom of light brings faith. God says, don't operate in fear. You don't belong to Satan's kingdom anymore. You belong to God's kingdom. Now, operate in faith, not fear. How many times a day do we slide, say we, slide into fear? That's the culture of the kingdom of darkness. That's not God's culture. That's not the kingdom of light. The kingdom of light is we operate in faith. God's got this. I know it's a mess, but God's got this. That's how we operate in the kingdom of God. That's how he wants us to operate. Darkness brings fear. The kingdom of light brings faith. Darkness brings anger. There is so much anger in America today. Anger on the streets all over the place. Anger in our news. Uh, that's the kingdom of darkness. That's why I said it's not a Democrat versus Republican. It's an evil versus righteousness today. That's the war that's going on in the politics for our presidency, for our nation. Kingdom of darkness produces hatred. You can just, it's vitriol is the word. It's just anger, that hatred. I disdain you. Where does that come from? Satan. Straight from the pit of hell. That's where it's coming from. Hatred. The kingdom of light produces, I love you. I love you. God says, I love you. Then he says to us to tell others, I know life's a mess, but I love you. Can I help? What can I do? Okay. The kingdom of darkness produces intimidation. Wow. The intimidation seen in the world today is amazing. The kingdom of light produces trust. When you find somebody in the kingdom who's walking in faith, you know you can trust them. Whereas people who are in the kingdom of darkness, they're out to intimidate you, scare the daylights out of you, and make you doubt your own sanity and your own choices. The kingdom of darkness, which is evil, brings harassment. I still have in my mind that picture of the, the black agitator, 
the Black Lives Matter with, with his uh, a Molotov cocktail in his hand, the, the glass bottle with a wick and some alcohol in it, and he lights it, and he's ready to throw it at this woman's store. And she's black, and she spent her whole life building this business, and he's going to burn it down. What in the world have we come to? You know, that's harassment. The kingdom of God is all about honor. I may not understand you. I may not even agree with you at times, but it's my job to honor you. Because honor comes through the kingdom of God. I may not even honor all of your choices, but you as a person, you have a right to exist, and I honor you. Darkness. I don't think that's mine. Uh, the kingdom of darkness breeds war. And you're in the middle of a war. The kingdom of light brings reconciliation. The kingdom of darkness brings theft. You know, they call it looting. Whose phone is that? Oh, okay. Okay. Well, I honor you and I love you. <laughs> so there. Take that. <laughs> uh, the kingdom of darkness breeds theft. We call it looting today. You know, it's just plain theft. It's nothing else but theft. But the kingdom of light brings the giving of gifts. God the Father gave you Jesus. Jesus gave you the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gave you gifts and fruit to live by. The kingdom of light is all about gifts. And the kingdom of darkness is all about theft, taking away from you what is rightfully yours. Two kingdoms, two cultures, that's why you feel stressed. It's going on around you and it's going on within you. And what comes from the cultures of darkness? The curses of God. God has placed his curses on those who operate out of the kingdom of darkness. And God has placed his blessings on those who are in the kingdom of goodness and righteousness. Are you beginning to understand why there's all this tension all day long, every day, not only out there, but in here? It's a war. And who do we know is going to win? You only got two choices. Believe the devil and be scared to death or rest in God. Okay? Okay. Which kingdom are you in? If you were physically born, how many of you were physically born here? I didn't, I didn't see any that came out of a test tube, so okay. Uh, if you were physically born, at one point at least, you were in Satan's kingdom. Because through Adam and Eve's fall came the fall of all mankind. And when you were born, you were born into the kingdom of darkness. And you could not communicate with God. It was only by the mercy and grace of God that he drew us by cords of love into his kingdom. So if you're born physically and only physically, then you're in the kingdom of darkness. And what does that mean? It means you're under the control of Satan. That ought to be a scary thought. Uh, under Satan's kingdom of darkness, we simply believe the lies he tells us. Folks, we're in the kingdom of light. We should not be believing the lies of Satan. Satan said, I'm going to destroy this nation. I'm going to destroy your life. I'm going to take your health. I'm going to do this. I'm going to steal your money. I'm going to bring you to poverty. Our response should be, huh, yeah, you and what army? Because I'm a child of God. And you're just a creation, and he's the creator, and he's more powerful than you are, and you can't. And I'm resting in him. I'm resting in him. So take that. We've got to learn to laugh at the devil. I'm serious. We're so afraid of the devil. Why are you afraid of him? Number one, he's the enemy. Number two, he was defeated 2,000 years ago. I know the Bible says he walks around as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. I get that. But remember, at Calvary, Jesus knocked out his teeth. 
How ferocious is a lion with no teeth? That's what Calvary was all about. Satan's kingdom. In the kingdom, we speak in a, a, a language of anger and hatred. And there's actions of fear and pride. And those who live only under Satan's kingdom live under the curses of God. And they're in there. But if you receive Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, if you looked at God and said, God, I'm a mess. I am one hot mess, God. I have sin. I have rebellion within me. I need you, Jesus. I thank you that you love me enough to die on the cross, and I receive you into my life. And I not only make you my Savior, but God, I'm making you my Lord. Take over. You now are the senior in control of my life. Do that for me, Lord. If you'll do that, you then have been, as Jesus said, born again into the kingdom of God. And you're under whose control? You know, under either one, you're not under your own control. The joke is people who think they're in control have no control. Because if you're under the kingdom of darkness, you're under Satan's control. If you're under the kingdom of light, you're under the Holy Spirit's control. And we try to control so hard. I know. I get there. <laughs> and he says, you're not in control. We are under the control of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We believe the truth rather than the lies. We believe the truth of the Word of God. It is inerrant. In the original writings, the Word of God is inerrant. There's no error within it, so we believe the truth of God. We speak the language of the culture of the kingdom of God, which is love and peace. And we act not in fear and in pride, but in faith and in humility. These are the goals. Am I there 24-7? Just check with my wife. Don't bother. You know, please don't. <laughs> uh, do I live there 24-7, 365? No, but I'm trying, and I'm better than I was. And God's going to get me there because the Word says that he who hath begun a good work in me will bring it to completion. He will finish what he started within me. And because I live in the kingdom of God and I strive through the power of God within me to do those things, then I live under the blessings of God. I get the blessings of God. Why? Because I'm His. Okay? Now, here's your choice. How are we doing? Here's your choice. In Deuteronomy 11, 26, and in Deuteronomy 30, 19, God says it again. How many of you know if God says something once, it's probably real important? But if He says it twice in the same book, it's really important. Listen to what God says first to the nation of Israel, but also to you and me. I call this day the heavens and the earth as witnesses that I have set before you. Say me. I have set before me. He has set before me today two options, your choice, life or death. We could say light or darkness. You want to walk in darkness? You want to walk in the light of Christ? Life or death? Blessings or cursings? Now, choose life so that you, and I love this, and God says, and your kids too. Tag, you're it, Jason. <laughs> so that you and your children may live abundantly through Christ. Wow. Wow. But he says, you know what? Your choice. Folks, we have a choice all day long. And I'm telling you that regularly we choose the wrong choice. We choose to live in fear. We choose to live in anxiety. We choose to live under stress and to let that stress get to us. And he says, it's your choice. You can either rest in me or you can be scared to death. How many of you know the world's a mess out there? It's imploding. A wonderful book out there about the seven major kingdoms of the world that have already historically existed. 
And every one of them failed for the exact same reasons. And you could read the books, one of those great big fat thick books. But uh, basically every one of those kingdoms failed. Medo-Persian, Greco-Roman, you know, uh, Babylonian kingdom. All of the great kingdoms of the world failed, not because they were attacked from without, but because they disintegrated from within. We are disintegrating as a nation from within. You know, it's time to wake up and at, at that point to say, God, we're going to trust in you. We're going to rest in you. It's time for the church to become the army of God that begins to believe the word of God and act like they believe the word of God. Not living like the world, but living like the kingdom of God, the culture of the kingdom. And so God says to me, in other words, I just need you to rest in me. What I've said in my word is true. Rest in me. And in my word and in my promises, trust me. And trust my character. What's his names? Jehovah Rapha, the Lord our healer. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord our peace. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord our, pro our provider. Uh, you know, Jehovah Sh uh, uh, Shemach, the Lord who is there with you right now in the midst of your battle. And, the, and there's like two pages of those in the Old Testament, uh, you know, where God says, my name is... His name is his character. It's who he is. You can trust that. Trust it. So he says, act like you believe me. You say, I know, but it's so hard. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verses 6 through 10 synopsized here. And to you who are still troubled, okay, to you who are still troubled with all of this, Rest with us. For when the Lord Jesus shall return, and he shall, when the Lord Jesus shall return from heaven with his angels, and then I kind of put in the bottom there what the rest of the passage is saying, God's going to set it all straight. You think it's a mess? It is. In fact, it's probably worse than you and I think it is. You know what else? God's got it under control, and he's only going to let it go so far, and then he's going to end the reign of terror by your enemy, Satan. And Satan will be bound forever in the lake of fire, and the lake of fire will be, or hell will be cast into the lake of fire, the book of Revelation says, and he and all who followed him will be gone, and all that will be left are the righteous. And we're going to have an eternity the likes of which you can't even imagine. And it's going to be awesome. And we already won. Folks, God didn't call you to survive. God called you to thrive. You understand that? Don't live in fear. Now, we who, be, who have believed, have you believed God? We who have believed God, we now continuously enter. That's the command. That's the goal. That's the gold standard. That you and I continuously enter into that rest. Folks, that's a decision every moment of every day. It's a new decision every moment of every day. Am I going to wake up, put it on the floor and say, Good Lord, morning? Or am I going to wake up and say, Good Lord, morning, Lord? You know? And all day long, I'm going to say, God, I trust you. I rest in you. You've got this. I don't got it. I don't even understand what's going on, but you do, and you've got it. That enter continuously into that rest. Hebrews 4, 12. For he that has entered into Christ's rest has ceased from his own works Stop trying to earn salvation. Stop trying to earn the blessings of God and realize he loves you. Rest in that blessing. Okay. Even as Christ rested from his own works on the seventh day, we rest in Christ and his works, not in our own. Here it is. Last slide. We're done. The Believer's Creed. We're just too blessed to be stressed because we're at rest. 
It's so simple. I, I want you to grab a hold of this in your spirit. It's the whole sermon in a nutshell. You say, well, Pastor, why don't you just preach this one only? Because that's not me. Okay. We're too blessed to be stressed, so we're at rest. I, I'm, I'm going to ask you to say it with me, and I want you to just say, I'm, I'm, make it personal, you. I'm too blessed to be stressed, therefore I'm at rest. Would you say that with me? I'm too blessed to be stressed, therefore I'm at rest. Y'all like that sermon? I need I don't know if you needed it. I knew I needed it.